this session is part of the uh, Being Human Festival, the Festival of the Humanities, uh, which uh, is the first, the UK's first national festival that celebrates the humanities uh, and showcases research in the humanities. And it's run here out of the School of Advanced Study, um, but it has events uh, taking place not only in London and Senate House, but also um, uh, elsewhere in uh, in the country uh, this week, um, and uh, it's it's a national festival, as I said, uh, which we're doing in partnership with the Arts and Humanities Research Council, uh, as well as the British Academy. And uh, there's a sentence that I'm required to read. Uh, it aims to demonstrate the vitality, vibrancy, and relevance of the humanities through a national program that demonstrates how the humanities shape our everyday lives. Uh, and I hope these are words that do resonate in light of the Education Secretary's remarks uh, just uh, recently. Um, uh, my name is Wim van Mierlo and I'm Acting Director of the Institute of English Studies, which is one of the ten institutes in the School of Advanced Study. And I just wanted to do a, a little plug for another event that we uh, organize or are involved with um, in collaboration with the Roham Roehampton Poetry Centre. Um, this is a reading by uh, Don Patterson and Pascal Petit on the uh, 10th of December at uh, 7 p.m. Uh, again here in Senate House, and this is this is also a free event. Um, I just need to load up my PowerPoint quickly. Um, before I introduce um, our speakers, our poets, and our scholar for this evening, um, I wanted to uh, briefly give a, give a, give a sense of uh, literary drafts and manuscripts um, and what we do with them, uh, perhaps as scholars, to set up the discussion that will take place later on. Um, Literary drafts and manuscripts have perhaps a somewhat ambivalent status in our culture, certainly in comparison to other um, heritage objects, uh, particularly if we're dealing with um, past uh, writers and poets from the past. On the one hand, our national and university libraries collect, preserve, and make accessible the treasure troves of our literary heritage. Um, at least where these are not bought up by American institutions. On the other hand, that literary heritage remains perhaps not hidden, uh, but at least difficult to unlock. Manuscripts speak to the imagination, but they often remain difficult to interpret. The value of manuscripts, and I refer here to their market value, uh, as, also, as well as what Philip Larkin called its magical value, is widely recognized. Yet, despite the tangible way in which manuscripts speak to the imagination, they remain perhaps only visible to uh, a very few, uh, very few people. And I'm not talking here about the collectors specifically who can afford to buy these, ma to buy these manuscripts and lock them away in their, um, in their vaults. Um, I'm talking here about um, the few scholars, perhaps, who have the means and the time to visit these libraries and museums uh, to study these manuscripts. And this is very unlike the, the art collections, uh, the national art collections that we have. Um, anyone can walk off the street into the National Gallery to see the most famous paintings. Uh, you can't do the same, really, with, um, with a literary manuscript. Um, and even if you can, it's, they're strange objects. Um, they're, they're, they're slightly, perhaps, at first sight, impenetrable. Um, and perhaps do require more expensive, uh, more extensive, expensive as well sometimes, expertise. So the magical value that Larkin uh, talked about um, pertains, in the first instance, to the particular aura that these objects hold, the feeling of wonder that you might have, or that people have, who come into contact with these people, with these objects, the realization that uh, perhaps Keats 
um, or Wilf Owen or Sylvia Plath had actually touched these pieces of paper. They actually have their handwriting on these pieces of paper. But this magical value is for some also deeply problematic. After all, isn't it the final poem that matters? The work of art itself rather than these pieces of paper? Isn't there something perhaps vulgar and irrelevant about manuscripts? Tennyson um, believed that um, his manuscript as well. Tennyson believed that no one should really be interested in the chips that fall on the work floor. T.S. Eliot wondered why anyone or why any writer should wish to leave his or her manuscripts to an institution and thereby contribute to what he called the national supply of pulp. <laughs> And yet, I, I, at least I believe that our culture would be so much the poorer if we didn't have these manuscripts of our great writers and poets. Um, for the value, in study, the value of studying these manuscripts is not about exposing what he or she may not have wished uh, to, to, to make public, what he or she may, might have rejected or has rejected because it wasn't good enough. I think the value lies in what they reveal about the creative process itself. How the poets got, say, there, that finished poem, from here are very early drafts. And this is an example uh, from uh, Yeats's uh, The Wild Swans of Cool, which in its finished form begins with these wonderful lines, the trees are in their autumn beauty, the woodland paths are dry. And yet, it's slightly humbling perhaps, or maybe disappointing, I don't know, depending how you look at it, uh, to, to know, to see how this poem began with the rather prosaic lines, um, the trees, sorry, the, the trees are in their autumn beauty, that's, sorry, that's the final poem, the leaves grown brown in autumn, the water in the lake is low. <laughs> the point, however, is it's not so much what's bad about these drafts, but it, again, that trajectory how this happened, how Yeats started out with this and then ended up with these beautiful lines. So what the evolution of a poem in the manuscripts makes abundantly clear is that poems do not grow on cabbages or in cabbages. And what strikes me as almost perverse is the way in which um, many literary critics, as well as many readers perhaps, and even writers, um, still believe that, that poetry and writing is somehow something immutable. Um, and remind me of Charles Lamb um, and his utter dismay when he, uh, on a dark day, was shown the manuscript of Milton's Lycidas. Um, he was staggered to find out the writing on it, the cancellations, the interlinear writing, the, 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 the words in between the lines. And I quote, as if their words, their words, the words of the poem, were mortal, alterable, displaceable at pleasure, as they might have been otherwise and just as good. He found the difficulty, in other words, that Milton's poem was different on paper, that it had not flowed direct and complete from the poet's mind. And although today critics like to talk, but don't like to talk any longer about inspiration, um, they talk about the struggle with language, which seems essentially to be saying the same thing, except in different words. But writing, actually putting pen to paper, uh, or any writing tool of your choice on any writing object of your choice, um, writing as a physical but also creative activity is often simply not talked about. Writing in particular is not something commonly associated with being tied to the desk to a desk four or six or eight hours a day. And yet we have instances, we have comments made by Keats as well as Ted Hughes and others about exactly that, the slogging away at writing poetry. And it's for this reason that uh, I uh, decided to organize this session uh, on the poet and his manuscripts uh, for the Being Human Festival not only to showcase the sort of research that's possible and that's undertaken by scholars uh, working on literary drafts, but to ask a major contemporary poet to reflect on and talk about his own manuscripts and the creative processes that are part of that. 
and to do so in conversation with a literary scholar whose research deals with this process of drafting and revision. So I'm extraordinarily, extraordinarily pleased that Sean O'Brien has, has accepted my challenge, as it were. Um, Sean is the author of several volumes of poetry. Um, his first collection was The Indoor Park, which was published by Bloodaxe in 1983, uh, which was followed by uh, six other uh, collections uh, and a few more uh, in the pipeline. Um, including the more recently The Drowned Book from 2007, Afterlife from 2009, and November from 2011, to date his most recent collection. Uh, and he's won major prizes for his work, such as the Somerset Maugham Award, the Ian Foster Award, the Forward Prize for Best Collection twice, and the T.S. Eliot, uh, 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 Eliot Poetry Prize. And apart from being an acclaimed poet, he is also a critic, anthologist, a novelist, and a professor of creative writing at Newcastle University. Um, Dr. Hannah Sullivan, who will be conversing with Sean uh, this evening, uh, Hannah is a lecturer in English at Oxford University, where she specializes in 20th and 21st century literature, English literature. And she's recently published a book called, and I should have gone to the slide, this slide, I'm sorry. She's recently published the work of revision uh, published by Harvard University Press, which, which asks why writers place such great emphasis and such, such great faith in revising. Uh, it also asks how different types of revision produce determinate aesthetic effects. Uh, Hannah is also a poet uh, herself. Uh, and her work has appeared in several prestigious uh, magazines, uh, including Poetry Quarterly and the PN uh, Review. Um, that's all from me. Hannah, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for letting me look at some of these manuscripts. I mean, I think you're right that to literary scholars, these objects you know, exert a strange kind of erratic, magical um, fascination. I didn't have to do anything very expensive or extensive in terms of looking at them, um, I didn't have to go to dusty library archives because uh, Sean was kind enough to email me some images um, of um, his own manuscripts and also not only manuscripts, um, computer drafts. And perhaps um, I might start by saying that I wonder if one of the reasons why um, this whole area of research into drafts and manuscripts has become quite popular again in the last uh, five or ten years is, is, is a moment as we move maybe from a world in which many of us draft to be more really draft by hand a true world where people tend to compose directly onto the machine. In other words, the manuscript is becoming um, something of a different media age. And I think some of the sort of erratic fascination of these documents, uh, including, um, of course, sort of the, 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 the doodles, um, and the genetic critics are sometimes quite unsure how to interpret those, or if they have any significance at all, um, might be to do with the fact that these, these documents are receding into a technological um, past, but I, I guess I just wanted to start really um, from by asking you where for you a poem um, starts, and I, I guess that um, it's probably the apprehension. Um, is it in the the John book? In, uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, so um, it has a really um, fantastic, I think, and, and sort of literary and, and um, an elliptical opening um, in the final version, the one that we can read in the collected poems. I apologise. Um, colon. It sort of seems like it must have started there, uh, but it didn't, or at least it wasn't the first thing that you wrote down in the in the in the first um, draft. And so I was sort of struck that the first draft just didn't contain that, um, although it does contain the material that, that follows. I wondered if you could say anything about. Um, I think in the second draft, which is in my next slide, <laughs> it does appear. But um, how you decided to start there? Well, I would start by saying that once I finished writing a poem, the actual process by which it got into its finished state um, is lost to me. The way an actor, having been the production of something, you know, then forgets all the lines that he or she has so painstakingly learned. Mm -hmm. At the time, the drafting process is everything. And then when the poem you think I've done with that, it can go in the book. You, um, or at any rate, I lose the sense of 
where it was. So I found out actually having to look at some some drafts interesting in itself because I, in a sense I'm as much in the dark as you are as to why these things happen. Um, do you, do you feel if we look at the, the next one, you can see yeah. where this line um, appears, right? This is the second draft, I apologise. Yes. Yeah. When you come across something like that, is there, you, when you're writing a kind of eureka moment where you feel, aha, you know, this is this is where the poem's going to start, really may prig us in this draft, or do you find it more difficult to tell whether it's just sort of, an, you know, another go at something or whether it's really a breakthrough? I think... Um the statement, I apologise, um, addressed to the Supreme Commissioner mm -hmm. is, uh, well, it's a gesture, mm -hmm. you know, which invites the reader in and also presumably is intended to buttonhole the Supreme Commissioner were he to be listening, uh, which he wouldn't be. Um, mm -hmm. uh, A totalizing, a totalizing artist like Dante or, jo or James Joyce, who, are, who appear to have written the thing before they've written it, in a sense, you know, they've thought it through, through so extensively that it already exists before they've written it down in some way, would be able to explain much better than I have. Um, but there are two things, that's, there's a thing in the press that really struck me. And we were visiting Bruges, I don't know if it's apparent from the poem, you know, is actually set in Bruges, uh, not that that particularly matters, and the smallest stained glass window in the world is to be seen on a tower, weirdly positioned on a tower, a brick tower, uh, that you see from a canal. Um, but there was talk at the time of Blair being made a European commissioner for something, um, which is a very nightmarish prospect, I mean, because it's a Blair, you know, at the height of his presumption of derangement. Um, and I was thinking, well, this is where he'd be, you know, he'd be based, you know, in Belgium, you know, the sort of, and the kind of damp core of Europe, you know, giving out with the laws, you know, by which time he'd passed far beyond any sense of, you know, of democratic recall, any sense that he was actually beholden to anybody for his presumptions. So it's satirical in that sense, you know, I apologize, you know, forgive me for mentioning it. But also, there'd been this item in the paper, this is in 2005, where somebody in Hull, which happens to be my hometown, had been arrested for staring at a building. <coughs> which, you know, Kevin McLeod had probably better watch out, really. You know, um, all architects and architecture students and tourists wandering the streets. It was at the height of the, the government's desire to get everybody to have identity cards. You know, under the old administration, which seems now so very long ago, you know, but which was insistent and terrible at the time. So that's the kind of substrate of the poem. Mm -hmm. But I, I didn't want to address it terribly directly, you know, I wanted it to be a kind of sidelong way of dealing with it, mm -hmm. while also dealing with the idea of being in the very odd town of Bruges, which mm -hmm. exists purely for aesthetic purposes. You know. Its only economic function now is to fascinate visitors. It doesn't make anything, it doesn't produce anything. Its economic life left it when the rivers, the coast, dried up. So it's a very beautiful place, very strange. You know, and the light there is very um, Magritian. And the railway station has, or used to have, um, in the brasserie, a vast mural by Paul Delvaux, full of Delvaux's fetishistic little girls dressed in white dresses being menaced by giant black trains. You know? So it's a very strange, aestheticised place you know, from which politics might emerge. And it's also, it has a fascist history as well. That's fascinating, thank you. <laughs> um, this was, so, so I got to see a few of the, the different drafts and the, moving through manuscript and on to the computer of this poem. But I guess a question that, that genetic critics, you know, people who work on drafts often have about um, poems, the wasteland is kind of a good example, is sort of how big the dossier of relevant materials is, you know, where, where one poem starts and where another one starts, and you know, how much do you really include? Is, is it the case that, that poems are individuated from each other, you know, as they are in the print volume, like I'm sure there's collected poems here, or do they sort of bleed into each other? Does each poem have a private um, Genesis. And I guess I was struck in the, the next example of a, of a poem um, from his new collection um, that, that Sean sent me, um, with Grey Rose, 
but the fact that the first draft, as, as it was labelled, didn't really seem to me, but wouldn't have been, seemed to be from the outside to actually be a part of the poem. It seemed to be something about something different, or at least it didn't mention yet the, the, the main symbol, which was the, um, the rose. So um, here, I was just curious about, so on the, on the left-hand side, I guess this is something that I think you wrote in, in August of, of last year, is that right? Yeah, August yeah. of 2013. And this is the, I believe, the, the final version uh, when you went to Grey Rose Country um, after the days, more days, um, the last compilous finality that has not finished yet. Um, but the Grey Rose isn't there yet to start with, and so um, I wondered if you could comment on that at all and how the where the Grey Rose came from in this poem. It seems obviously the central subject. The first draft, um, again, this is strange to me, you know, when I look back and I thought, what is that doing there, you know, because it's, it's in a file on the computer called Grey Rose, and it's draft one, so, yeah. you know, I must have thought it had something to do with the poem that emerged from it, and there are certain verbal elements mm. that get transferred into something that's recognisably the poem. But the, I mean, to explain anything about the first one means kind of breaking a certain compact which assumes that a poem is, for certain purposes, a freestanding verbal object or event, and that, you know, one doesn't require a history of it. You know, but I was actually dealing with the death of a friend, and I was trying to find a way of rendering this without being too much, as they say in the theatre, on the nose about it, you know. So I was looking for an angle of entry to the subject. But by the time the poem actually started to, uh, as it were, have views of its own about what it was going to be, that preoccupation very much, you know, it had sunk out of view. Mm -hmm. And the idea of the grey rose really intrigued me because, as we know, the rose is the most capacious symbol one of the most capacious symbolic properties we have. It could mean, you know, could mean virtually anything. It has been used to all purposes, you know, historically in literature. Um, and I was just very interested in the idea, the idea of a rose which was sort of um, on the spectrum. It was a neutral thing, or even negative. You know. um, but it had certain powers and properties. Hmm. Yeah, but also I wanted not I wanted the the rose not to be too determinate. You know. I didn't want anybody reading it to the extent that you imagine something's going to be read by anybody else. But I didn't want it to seem as if the rose stands for X. You know. I just wanted the rose to do or be you know, whatever emerged from turning it over on the page. That's a, that's a so one of the lines that I guess I was struck right in the poem, um, well the phrases was, was this um, the grave with all regret which seemed you know, a little bit Tennessee in, in some way. And I, I suppose I'm wondering for any contemporary poet, you, know, you, you are going to be alluding to the literature of the past, especially if you say teaching English. And some of your poems, um, like the previous one, the apprehension, make these spec graphs or really direct quotation, things that are marked out in quotation marks. How do those things sort of feature in the drafting process when you were referring perhaps outside your own sort of personal landscape or to the, the language and phrases of another writer? And do they remain as sort of things that you can't revise in the same way? Or are they part of the scaffolding of creation? Um, yeah, well, allusion to pre existing work, it can be a kind of you know, it can be a crippling thing if a poem is merely, a, you know, a patching together of reference to this, that, or the other. You know, we, we have quite enough of that kind of thing. But um, when Grey, with all regret, just entered my uh, my thinking, I thought, well, that, you know, it's nearly a quotation from Tennyson, nearly a quotation from In Memoriam. But Tennyson, of course, is wild with all regret. You know, and I thought, well, Grey, with all regret. Again, uh, you have to bear in mind, at any rate, in my experience, that when you're writing these things, it's important that you don't know everything. Mm. You know, if you if you had an exhaustive model of the poem in your head, 
if I had an exhaustive model of the poem in my head beforehand, I probably wouldn't bother writing it. There has to be something I don't know, you know, that I have to pursue through the poem. Um, and if the poem has a resolution, it's not, it's not explanatory. It's more of a kind of um, a resolution of motifs mm. or of musicality. So I just became intrigued by that. There are certain poets whose work crops up in my head when I'm writing all the time. There are three or four great poems by William Empson, which I'm always having to stop myself quoting. You know? um, the contradictions cover such a range. You don't want Madhouse and the whole thing there. This last poem for the damned, the fathers found. Uh, imagine then by miracle with me what could not possibly be there and learn to frame a style from the despair. These are just some of the, you know, the most brilliant formulations mm -hmm. of particular emotional imaginative positions I've ever heard. And I wish I, I wish Anderson hadn't invented them. I wish I could invent them, but I can't. So, you know, I allude to them sometimes. Do you, do, do you find that you have to steer away from reading certain um, poets when you're in the middle of writing? That, I mean, the reason you don't want to be infected by their language? Or, and how does reading fit into the process of genesis and creation? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, you know, I read a great deal of poetry all the time yeah. because I, um, I write reviews and I write mm -hmm. criticism and I'm I'm very absorbed by contemporary poetry in particular, but also modern poetry in general. Um, I don't think reading poetry can do you any harm. I'm always trying to persuade students that they, they might consider doing a bit of it. <laughs> if they were going, going to consider writing some, it would probably be just as well to have read some. You know, but no, it's an unfashionable view. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, do you? Um, I mean, I guess that you... <laughs> The poem might begin in kind of the undecided and the murky and the, the kind of private places of the imagination, but, but you're talking about resolution. Um, how do you know when it's ended? I mean, Yeats has come up already. He said that the you know, poem comes right with a, a click, uh, like a closing box. But that's not, not the only view that, that 20th century writers have, have had. For Valerie, and then quoted by Auden, a poem is I never finish, it's only abandoned, you know, suggesting you can always get back to it. and revise it and, and maybe improve it for the present. I think Auden's you know, work of his own collected and selected poems has very much that kind of curatorial aspect where he wanted always to refurbish what we've done in the past, particular poetry of the 30s, and make it a poetry that could live and, and be active for him in the, in the present. So I suppose we have two very different positions there about whether a poem finishes itself at some point or whether it is, remains ongoing for the poet, if not, if not for other people. And I kind of wondered which of those you felt more sympathetic to. Well, in practice, um, as with forgetting the process by which a poem got to its finished state, mm. um, I have a sense that a poem is finished when it it completes some kind of circle within itself. You know, where it doesn't resolve so much mm. as um, maybe it resolves, but there's just a the completeness is formal, you know, it's not philosophical necessarily, mm. uh, it doesn't necessarily assume epigrams, you know, or proverbial wisdom, but there is a sense that the thing is, it has completed itself in, in the way that a piece of music might complete itself. You know? um, as for Yeats, well, his idea of a poem closing with a satisfying click like a box, well, lucky old Yeats, really. <laughs> 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 Good for him. Yeah. I mean, we know that Yeats worked like that. You know, he was a very hard-working poet. He didn't just sit there and things happen to him. You know, but, uh, but occasionally, occasionally, and by no means at the level of you know the circus animal's desertion or anything like that, there is the sense that you know something just you know the two tracks meet under the mountain, as it were. I I was once in Moscow, and the interpreter who was with us for a week. Uh, was a very interesting woman, and her father had been one of the engineers at the building of the metro, the Moscow metro in the 30s. You know. She said, it was very important, as you can imagine, that the tracks coming from different directions should meet exactly, <laughs> otherwise there would be consequences. <laughs> and occasionally, you feel that uh, things have met up like that. You, I don't know, you could say, there's a formal impulse and an imaginative impulse. There's a rationalising impulse and 
something that wishes to escape rationality, and occasionally they're reconciled. Yeah, I mean, that was, that's interesting. I mean, Yeats, too, I suppose, is someone who didn't really practice what he preached, and that he actually was an inveterate reviser and you know, changed a lot of his work after first publication. There's that other lyric about the friends that have I do it wrong, whatever I would make a song. I need to know what's at stake, it is myself that um, I remake. And um, it's, it's really great, obviously, to ask you questions about um, your creative process and about how you think about about drafting, but I think for people that, if you go back and say look at the Paris Review interviews, you know, interviews with novelists and poets in the 20th century, you do find that a lot of what writers say about what they're doing is not what they're really doing. And I suppose the question for any genetic critic is, why do writers position themselves in certain ways with respect to creativity? Um, what does it say about what, what kind of writer they're trying to be, maybe what their relationship to ideas about romanticism or inspiration are, and are they being honest? Um, I mean, I think T.S. Eliot actually was a poet who abandoned work much more successfully than Yeats did, although he didn't even you know, come up with maxims about poems coming sharp with a click. Um, but I, I suppose maybe that would lead us on to, to the question of both post publication revision. And I think you, you, you've said that you're someone that doesn't do a lot of revision after an initial publication. You tend to bring, but in some cases, you have these beautiful librarians' poem. It's kind of an example. Yeah, I. When I did, um, when I was assembling a collection of poems, I made some very small verbal alterations where I could see that something was just awkward, you know, and a tiny, mm. and I can't even remember what they were now, you know, where a tiny change would, from my point of view, mitigate things a bit. Mm. But I, I wouldn't want to spend time um, thoroughly rewriting things. I mean, all in this one case, he obviously felt, in some instances, that he had ethical problems. And the very famous example is Spain, you know, where he referred to the necessary murder. You know, he didn't want to reprint that. But a more, what might seem a less significant example is uh, whichever poem it is which ends uh, with. Uh, New Stars of Architecture, A Change of Heart, you know, a poem from his, his early years. He said, I, I came to realize actually I don't like new architecture. I only like old architecture. So this was not true. I can't help thinking you know, that he was adapting his conception of truth to certain moral prejudices that he was in the process of developing with the return of his Christianity. In a way, it was problematic for him to negotiate between the way in which the imagination works and the way in which morality works. You know, they might be cousins, but they're not married to each other. Right. Cousins yeah. should probably marry each other. <laughs> well, I, suppose, I suppose that maybe when, when poems go out and about in the world and are received and interpreted, then, then the poet sense of, of their pri sort of private property changes. And I think for all the end of September the 1st, 1939, you know, we must love one another or die became a very problematic line, but it was used by Lyndon Johnson in a campaign advert, you know, for um, a, a sort of an advert against nuclear war. You know, the advert shows a little girl picking the petals off a, off a flower and it says we must love one another or die, you know, the world will be blown up by the nuclear bomb. I, I suppose understanding the way in which in a new political arena that line could have been co-opted for those kinds of purposes was partly what made it seem so dishonest. I think well, it's interesting that as you say, that it is his own Christianity and his changing sense of his mission as a poet and that led to some of these acts of emotion in that way. Yeah, but in that, in that case, where he changed it, he changed it from all to out, doesn't he? So that's what he said he was going to do. And I think that's actually but did he ever a, actually do it? No, I don't right. think it is, in fact, a published text. Because the original, yeah. you know, the, what he originally wrote is, it seems to me, a Christian utterance. Um, mm. We must love one another or die. I, you know, we are we have obligations to one another. Which is imagine, imagine an American president mm. now. Even somebody as, you know, relatively morally sophisticated as Obama quoting that, you know, daring to quote that in an advertisement. Mm. You know, how dare you, you know, how dare you suggest we ought to love each other? The Republicans would respond. It's perfectly <laughs> obvious. Everybody ought to be out killing each other. So it's <laughs> possible. What are you, some kind of communist? <laughs> but the, the the great reviser of the generation of poets prior to me is the Irish poet Derek Mahon, one of the one of the 
major post-war poets writing in English, in my view. And Mahon just cannot leave his work alone. Every time he produces a collective poem, you know, he's kind of moved things around. A poem has fallen out of favor, or it's been restructured in some way. You know. And I once heard a very interesting lecture called Changes of Title and Punctuation in the Poetry of Derek Mahon, you know, where somebody had followed this process very carefully from the earliest poems that Mahon published to, at this stage, about 20 years ago, his first attempt to, to remake them. And I began to feel that there should be a kind of committee of people who are going to say, you know, step away from the poem, Derek. Um, yeah. Just let it lead its own life. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think unfortunately for, for people like me, you know, for graduate students who are writing PhDs, these, I wouldn't make this point, but these kinds of changes are really a godsend um, because they give you something to write your PhDs. <laughs> But for ordinary readers, it's not so clear that that's true. And certainly, you know, history is full of writers who provoked hostility from their readership by changing, you know, changing their work too much. I mean, I think Goss's, you know, response to James revising for the New York edition um, is salient. You know, he said that he was dribbling um, new wine into old bottles and that he'd spoiled, he'd spoiled his text. And, and Browning says the same thing about Tennyson, that he was busy spoiling his poems as hard as he could um, by <laughs> revising them, you know, ten, ten years later. And I, I guess there is a tension between the professional reader and the, the reader for pleasure, maybe, uh, that, that the academic critic, you know, likes to ferret about in the library looking for manuscripts, is delighted by any post-publication change which might allow them to, to hang an argument or to, to notice something uh, political. But maybe the, the lay reader isn't so keen. Um, but at, at, anyway, I just wondered if you would want to, to comment at all on um, this this stanza that you um, you omitted from the, the librarians. Yes, um, well, this full of information, isn't it? Yeah. The, the, I know it's a bit difficult for for people yeah. in the audience who won't have come across this poem, you know, to for a, the omissions from it have any significance. But mm. this is a poem about growing up where I grew up in Hull. The Hull Central Library had a wonderful and continually augmented contemporary and modern poetry section. When I was 14, 15, I was in there three or four evenings a week and at weekends, and it was just amazing. I got an education for nothing. Yeah? I don't suppose they still have the same volume of material at all, but the other draw was the fact that all the librarians, who were all women, were very beautiful. So, you know, I was in there a lot, you know, partly for spiritual, literary purposes, and partly not. Yeah? And I, would, I was asked to write a poem this is a commission, in fact, you know, which is sometimes a bit of an odd thing to do. But um, Picador, my publishers, were celebrating 40 years of publishing. So they asked for a poem about 40. I thought, well, this happened about 40 years ago, so I'll talk about this. But in the second stanza of the poem, I tried to suggest that, you know, I was in there to read the poetry, but I could tell perfectly well that the librarians were novel readers. You know. And for a year, maybe two years, this stanza sat there, stanza two, you know, there were nine, there must have been, though it was novels that they read, not Hughes and Lowell, Larkin, Plath and Yates and Elliot and Orden, New Lines and the New Poetry, but Thomas Hardy, Margaret Drabble, Doris Lessing, Wolfe and Dreiser. And for two years, something nagged at the back of my mind, thinking there's something horribly wrong with that stanza. Well, now it seems to be just terribly clumsy and also a bit smart ass by sticking Dreiser on the end of it. You know, it's just that. The two of my women friends are the only people I've ever met who read the novels of Theodore Dreiser. You know, I think he was a bit of a specialised tellist in this country. And these two women friends of mine are both Americans, you know, so they have a reason for reading Dreiser. And I looked at the poem again to put it in the collection which is coming out in the spring. I thought, get rid of it. You know, get rid of it. It's just a distraction from the main energy of the poem, which is the atmosphere and the sense of these female librarians as kind of quite emancipated people, you know, with lives to lead and preoccupations, you know. And that that sense of possibility that they opened up uh, has gone. They have gone. You know, the, those lives are over, you know, the possibility and here I am still reading poetry, yeah. I see something a little bit poignant about Larkin's presence there, and I think I guess for Lawrence you think Hull and librarian yeah, yeah, yeah. the person that comes to mind is Larkin, it's some sort of sad that they weren't even reading Maybe he was in the library for the same reason. <laughs> <laughs> it is said that Larkin has a bad rep, you know, but uh, it, 
it is said that Larkin was extremely good to his staff. Mm. He, uh, he looked after them, apart from the ones he had affairs with. The, right. But the, the rest, you know, he looked after and took an interest in and encouraged professionally. You know, he wasn't as monstrous as sometimes suggested. But that's by the part. Right. <laughs> um, one of the, in, in my project on revision that, that was um, basically about modernist writers, I, I guess I ended up making quite a lot of the difference between writers who delete material, you know, produce long first drafts and then remove whether it's whole standards or simply phrases, and writers who add as they go along. I don't know if that seems to you into, at all useful as a way of thinking about your own drafting process. And I suppose in the book I was arguing that this was how writers in the high modernist period tended to work, not by substituting or by kind of perfecting, but by cutting swathes of material, sort of hemming away anything you know you can omit, or by adding large amounts of material. I guess that from the very limited number of things I've seen, your drafting process doesn't maybe on the whole seem to show signs of either massive excision or adding, but I'm aware that I've seen very, very little. Um, I don't know if you do you see yourself as a more of a cutter or more of an adder. Uh, well, not very helpful. I think a bit of both, you know, in the sense that occasionally a poem gets um, gets mired in a line of development that it's not, it has no proper destination, so that has to go. Um, but I'm, I'm very interested in the, at the moment. I'm very interested in the idea of writing long poems. You know, like, project to write any long poem. Uh, so I'm definitely interested in adding. You know. But I don't want it to be the kind of long poem which is merely virtuous, you know, mm. you know where the virtue lies in the fact it's long. I would, I would like it to be the sort of long poem that people would actually derive pleasure from reading, you know, which may be asking a lot you know, in a, a period when long poems, with the odd major exception, mm. Not to happen. What do you think your interest in writing long poems relates to an interest in, in fiction to some extent? I know that you've you have a novel that's already been published and you've got a novel that's coming out and you're a short, you're a short story writer as well. Is there a kind of proto novelistic aspect to the kind of long poem that you're thinking of in terms of the kind of detail it would include, or is it the non lyric? Uh, I'm trying to figure out how to encompass the kind of detail that interests me, which is sometimes very plainly realistic and sometimes mm -hmm. more fantastical and expressionist, without having a great explanatory set of impedimenta, you know? Mm -hmm. you know, without it becoming too much a way of accounting for itself, you know. You know, I'd like a long poem, 1,200 lines long, that can kind of went like the clappers. Mm -hmm. You know, that the went like lightning, in which the event of it, the event of the poem for the reader would be one of a kind of mobility and absorption, mm. rather than being slightly on the outside of it, which is the way contemporary readers, I suspect, tend to feel about long poems now. Kind of, as they say in the theatre, a kind of immersive Long right. poem, right? I mean, how, do, how do you think the question of internal formal organisation or even sort of prosody fits in here? I and mean, I guess you know, the cantos, like the pounds idea is about major form, um, it's an example of a poem that is supposed to teach you how to read itself, but maybe it doesn't do so adequately for people to actually enjoy reading it in, in some ways or to read it past the first 30 pages of the book as a whole. I mean, do you, uh, Eliot's long poems tend to be in, in metrically rather diverse. So that when we're just talking about Bert Norton, you get switches from sort of small lyric sections to kind of longer verse paragraphs that are more philosophical. Do you imagine that there would be a mixture of sort of poetic forms in a long poem? Or would it be organised in stanzas or? Well, possibly. I mean, it's very early days, you know, I'm just sort of walking around the outside of this at the moment, mm. wondering, you know, it would. Because of my preoccupations, you know, you would have a historical and political dimension to it, as well as an imaginative and lyric dimension to it. So, I mean, how do I actually get this to move? Yeah? Well, obviously, you can't impersonate McNeese. Yeah? There's no point in trying to rewrite Autumn Journal. 
which is possibly the most appealing yeah. modern world of art. Yeah. So you have to find another way of doing it. And I've, you know, this is to anticipate. I have no idea if this will be the case. But I'm interested in something which is, has a kind of a kind of a hectic pell-mell quality to it. Mm -hmm. you know? So I'm interested in the tercet form, which I use quite frequently, uh, which is frequently open at the end of the stanza. You know, the ter one tercet opens onto the next. You know? I'm not quite sure how this stacks up. You know, as a theory, as a prosodic theory, but it's something I appear to be doing. So something which is at once detailed and propulsive would interest me. That's really interesting. I mean, the thing about tests, I guess, is that they do at least types of humour never comes to an end. And so you don't get that like, Yeats effect of it closing like a like a box. I mean, my students last year were very struck by going to the Bodleian and also to look at the manuscripts of Shelley's Triumph of Life because they it's not really clear whether he ended it or not. I mean, it's yeah. obviously not finished as a whole, whether or not he got to the last line or he didn't. Um, but the decision of how to pick a last line for something that is in a form that seems to be always propelling itself forwards is really, it's really difficult, I guess. Um, I was definitely um, interested in, in the, um, it's the next example, the, the, um, this, this poem, um, The Lost of England, which does organise itself into um, tercets in the final in the final version and also in one of actually the early drafts I hope this is right this is the very first draft is in uh, rhythmic you know a bit, a bit raised paragraphs really um, and in the fourth draft you know I was struck by the fact it had emerged into what I knew to be the final form and I guess often critics of manuscripts genetic critics were cheated away by looking at the final thing first you know you want to, you want to check it out but I, after this fourth draft, you went back into um, something that looked more like the, the first draft before re-emerging again into the, the tercet form of the ends. That, that was a really interesting kind of recursive sort of structure in the, in the drafting process. I just wondered if you wanted to comment at all on how you came to the, the sort of 3-3 three, three structure here or, or what, what the uncertainty reveals in the drafting process mm. and the fact you went away from it before coming back to it. Well, given the fact I can't remember, um, <laughs> allowing for that, I, I would speculate that um, it was clear to me that writing it in verse paragraphs didn't have sufficient rhythmic animation. Mm. We haven't really got the time to go into all the detail of that now. When I look at it, I think this is one step up from extended notes, really, the first, the first one. There's plenty of detail, you know, but it, there's no motor. And then when it got to the fourth version where I suddenly thought, well, why not the tercet, you know, because I use the tercet a lot. And things began perhaps to sort of focus themselves more clearly, you know, mm. organize themselves a bit more. And then I probably thought, oh, I'm always using the tercet. Maybe I should go back to the paragraph, you know. Yeah. I got stymied with that. Um, but also, it may be the case that there's a whole 30-line chunk of this which finally got dropped when I realised, you know, that while I was interested in it, it didn't really belong in this poem. You know, where the poem kind of pauses in a small provincial town and imagines uh, various things going on there. I thought, this is not where I want to be. You know, I need it to be on the train more. I need to be back on the train. So the whole thing now takes place on the train. The, the people are either beside the track or imagined as being near on the other side of the trees beside the track or they're about to get on the train. You know. So the train kind of draws everybody into it I suppose. Mm -hmm. you know, that's the unifying principle. Really. Yeah I was really struck in the process of watching this poem emerging in the drafts by how um, things did seem that the different um, you know, objects and, and ideas in the original version did really seem quite successfully to fuse into an organic whole by the, by the final version. So also the relationship between this quite boring, you know, familiar to many of us task of marking the essay, or you know, thinking, trying to decide or what grade the essay ought to get, an essay about Hardy and Houseman. This Hardy Houseman is interesting in itself, I think, the little dash, is it? it's like a journey, you know, Hardy to Houseman, yeah. literary history, Hardy to Houseman. Um, and, and these sort of poets of, I don't know what, but in between spaces, I suppose, or middle, middle England in some ways, yeah. uh, rural, and, rural England is punished. I mean, to speak quite out of, out of turn, you know, 
I wasn't reading an essay about Hardy and Houseman. I was reading an essay about Alan T.S. Eliot or something. Well, that's no use yeah. to me for the yeah. purposes of the poem. You know, I have to get Hardy and Houseman in there. You know. Right. So I made, it, I made it up. You made it up. <laughs> that, that's, actually, I was really curious about that question, though, because it, it seems like some of your, in your last volume, um, I guess especially, you have written quite a few sort of memoir poems or, or elegiac poems, like the elegy of your mother, and I, I suppose there is some, in the question of ethics and veracity in, in the choice of detail in those poems maybe is a little bit different, I don't know, um, from a, a poem about, say, Mark and essay on a on a trip that you describe your mother in a green coat. Is it, yeah. Wasn't it really green? Yes, or, it was, yeah. It, seems, it sort of seems like it's important that it was really green. It was a very nice just green suede green. jacket that she wore for yeah. years and years. It started out as being, as it were, a good jacket. Yeah. And then gradually moved over into being one she wore when she was in the garden. Yeah. In that, in that particular poem, um, there was no need to invent anything. The, the detail was already there. Would it have felt in that poem, you know, if for some reason it had been easier to put blue or red, or would it have felt improper to do that? Yeah, I mean, that there are limits yes, yeah, yeah. possibilities. Yeah, <laughs> right, exactly. It's, unless, yeah. Um, you know, there are rules about these things mm. unless it is necessary to break them. Mm. So it has to be a green jacket. But there wasn't really an essay about how the enforcement, yeah. but for the purposes of the poem, there has to be one. I think it's, um, you, you know, writers of fiction do have a different task, I suppose, in revising from writers of autobiography. I mean, it's usually much more stressful for people to revise their autobiographies than it is for them to revise fiction, because we're essentially accepting that you can play with all the, you know, the characters' names, the, the settings, you know, or the, the plot of, of fiction in a way that you're not really supposed to do with autobiography. If you seem to be doing it, it's, it rather defeats the purpose of the, you know, sincere enterprise. I guess poetry kind of sits or lyric poetry between these two poles. Maybe, I mean, in terms of you, some things you can invent, some things you can't, some things you have freedom to alter, well, some things you don't. I try and consider the idea that the poem, the poem has its own sense of necessity. Mm. You know, yes, you are the author of the poem, but not all the material of the poem is voluntary or deliberate, and not all the connections that the poem throws up are intended. In fact, it is, it's extremely important to poetry, it seems to me, that there are things which were not, as I said a while ago, which are not pre-formed. You know, they're not the product of prior deliberation, but opportunities that particular coincidences of language enable you to, to incorporate in the poem. You know. So there's a curious sense of liberty when two or three lines suddenly deliver themselves. It sounds dangerously like inspiration. It's not. I think it's just being that curious mixture of alertness and relaxation that occasionally comes if you're lucky when you're working on a poem. Mm. Where suddenly, you know, you kind of, you escape from a certain prison of logic mm. you know, to say something that lives next door to it that's not quite the same as it. Do you find pleasure in me reading your own published poems, complete poems, or...? I don't do it very you much. Do it very much. Um, well, I've had a look, because I did, had to do the collective, yeah. so I had to look at them, you know. And, uh, uh, one or two poems I left out because they were just so awful. Um, but I took the line that my friend, the late Peter Porter, took when he did his first collected poems back in the late 70s. He said, it would have been easy to go through this book and revise it, but I won't play the prig to the young man who wrote the poems. You know? So this, you know, what I have written, I have written, for good or ill. You know? And if anything is too embarrassingly bad, you can leave it out. But it's, it would seem crazy to me, in my early 60s, to go back and write things I, rewrite things I wrote in my mid-20s. You know? I mean, I'm, I'm not even biologically the same person anymore. No cells, My you? cells have all been replaced. Yeah, I, mean, I think it's it's interesting that there are so many poets who do do that, and that very often those poets who are most interested in being playing the prick to their younger selves are poets whose work is very centrally about questions of revision in some ways. I mean, maybe Wordsworth being the best example, but you know, this the this history of his writing, the Prelude, seems a history of 
someone trying to work out what the meaning of his own limbs is. You've got the you know, 70, 99 spots of time, and then he just thought for another 50 years about how he felt in relationship to those events of his childhood. Um, and I suppose the way critics have said that Wordsworth was playing a trick to his younger self, you know, um, putting a kind of later style on top of an earlier, purer style. In some ways, it seems a key with the project that he kept on on doing it. And so, yeah. is there an assumption in the case of Wordsworth? Is there an assumption by Wordsworth that somehow he could arrive at the right position, mm. which would somehow be not the product of you know the historical present in which he was living as an older man? thinking about this, but somehow return, but with knowledge, mm. you know, to the position of a younger man. Yeah, it's a kind of idealism, I suppose, as yeah. opposed to a kind of accurate historicism. I suppose Auden's desire to revise his poems is the same thing as about updating them so that they're accurate in the present, that it's kind of considered to be eternal in some ways, rather than leaving them as historic documents, you know, in their mistakes or limitations in the, in the past. And Auden does seem to have been happy to republish um, poems from the 1930s in anthologies of poems from the 1930s as documents from that era, but yeah. just didn't want them to be in his collected um, poems. I wonder if Hardy has something to say about this. There's mm. a poem, The Self on Oh, yeah, yeah. About, you know, a remembered scene. Yeah. They're sitting by the fire, he blowing, blowing higher yeah, and higher yeah, and higher. Yeah, yeah. But we were looking away. Yeah. Which conveys both, you know, the the intimate sense of what was once the present, with the knowledge that it was not known in quite that way at the time. You, know, you have to have you have to have the melancholy friction between two kinds of experience in order to get the poem. Yeah, this yeah, the woman much missed um, um, with its. As a weird revision, like the wistlessness and listlessness, yes. which you know, he sort of the rhyme kind of seems to set up and drives the revision, I suppose. Yeah, you know, Hardy would be really. Um, Isn't there a version of it where it says existlessness? Yeah, I think so. Which is just Leavers. awful. Yeah. <laughs> Perhaps if it was the one that we knew, it wouldn't seem so awful to us. I mean, yeah. one of the challenges of doing this kind of work, I think, is, is tending to prefer the thing that you saw first, which is always the yeah. ways yeah. the last last version and so it can be quite alienating and uh, upsetting as well to go back and I mean just as as, as one said about um, Lamb to go back and look at things in their original version although exciting too um, I was wondering um, if you might say a little bit about technology would, you, would that be possible I mean I've just copied these into PowerPoint slides from but what were from Word documents yeah didn't it always seem worth trying to put an image of your Word document into a slide because we don't know what Microsoft Word looks like. But your manuscript doodles and you know your handwriting are really fascinating, and they do seem to, that seems like a lot of erratic power that the Word document unfortunately kind of lacks because it's the same as anybody else's. It's not yours really. Um, would you be able to say something about how you use the computer versus the the pen, or if you use the typewriter at all, or writing your head? Um, well, as, you know, I always write on A4 typing paper or copying paper. Oh. I've never been able to write more than brief notes in a notebook. I don't know why, you know, it just has to be a separate piece of paper, which is why the manuscripts of my work are in such a chaotic state and why it was so difficult for me to find anything <laughs> to show you. But uh, because they just accumulate, you know, they sediments on top of each other and occasionally they get put into files and the rest mm. of but I, it used to be the case that I'd write by hand, and then when I had something, I would type it up manually on a typewriter. But as soon as the word processor came along, I suppose in some views, the, the corruption set in. Mm. You know, the, you think, what does that look like, you know? I can type it up on a screen, and then move it around. What would it look like? You know? So there's a risk of moving too quickly to a sense of completion. But then, if you do a lot of typing, you become almost as quick at typing as you do at writing by hand. And so it's not, it's not quite as fraudulent as it might seem. I tend to type something, print it off, make handwritten revisions, and then go back to the screen, incorporate them and so on. Um, I, my friend, the great, my great friend Douglas Dunn, uh, for a long time, I think he thought 
any kind of writing that didn't involve using a chisel and a piece of stone was deeply immoral. <laughs> I think, you know, the typewriter is a kind of perverted development of modernity. You know? but I think, and I kind of see his point, you know, if, if it takes effort to write the damn thing down, you know, then in some sense you mean it. You know? I, I kind of understand that. Um, so I, I have uneasy feelings about it, but if you're writing something pretty long, you know, yeah. You need somehow to be able to get a view of it. You need to be able to get a view of it. As to the doodling. Yeah. You can see some examples if you're not too ashamed. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, well, again, going back to Douglas Dunn, who, when I was a young man, uh, used to read my work all the time and tell me what was wrong with it and give me things to read. You know, so it was, I learned a great deal from it. But he once saw a page of manuscript and described it as fascist doodle. <laughs> and I kind of see what he meant because, um, well, it seems to me that the doodles are looking for form, but never quite able to settle on them. You know? They're looking for control and consequence and order, but they're always kind of growing extensions, you know, mm. or extra bits, or being interfered with in some way. And that, I don't know, maybe that's analogous to the process of trying to write the poem. Yeah. That's really that's really cool. Maybe maybe Microsoft need to introduce like a doodle function in <laughs> Word so that we can convey some better on the on the computer. Yeah. I mean, it's like the idea of that constraint is pretty interesting. I mean that you don't actually want to type too fast or write too fast, that you want to introduce something that slows you down. I was very struck that Sylvia Plath, who is was was a very efficient typist, um, probably one of the best typists I would imagine of, of, of mid twentieth century poets writes all of her poems by hand and she actually also has rather an unfortunate sort of baby-like handwriting. I mean, it's not an elegant handwriting at all. Um, she typed up Ted Hughes's poems for him, um, you know, as well as working at Mademoiselle magazine where she was busy a typist. Uh, I always wondered why she why she did that and I, I think, you know, also thinking about Johnny uh, Panic in the Bible of Dreams where the, you know, the woman is typing up other people's dreams. And for her, typing must have meant something mechanical or something that was too easy to produce. And perhaps something that was associated with women's work, whereas it was something kind of artisanal and, and sort of serious and masculine for writing by hand. Um, but I guess some of these things have changed a lot in the contemporary kind of writing culture, where people write onto tablets or you know, record things onto their phone. We have some new choices now about how to in the case of Sylvia Plath, it, it might also, mm. from what one reads, have been a way for her to keep tabs on what he was doing. You know? No. You know, typing them up meant she got a very, very detailed sense of what he was writing. Interesting, we found that she was revising as she went, but, yeah, <laughs> making them worse. Early, yeah. But, uh, yeah but, do you, I mean, these documents on this screen, probably to you, they, I don't know, you've, you've, it's great that you've kept them and labelled them, um, and that's obviously in a way for our benefit rather than, than yours. Um, these are so valuable to genetic critics and you know, scholars who want to go to archives and, and work on the genesis of um, writers' materials. But I, I suppose, would you be able to say anything about your level of interest, really, in having people look at these documents? I suppose it's a a bigger question about how far you welcome literary criticism of your work as a, a whole, but I mean, do you think people are barking at the wrong tree, basically, if they are spending, you know, hours, weeks, months, years in dusty library archives looking through these kinds of documents? No, I don't, I don't. I mean, because um, if it's interesting, it's interesting. You know. If it's of interest, then it's not particularly in my case, but you know, in general, looking at manuscripts, mm -hmm. it's valuable. It, it, it sheds light, or it sheds potential light, or it opens up possibilities of interpretation. You know? um, I think there is a problem with intentionality. Mm. You know, the fact that you can see drafts one, two, three, four, five, six, and so on, makes it perhaps tempting to assume that there is a kind of progression, mm. some kind of linearity in which what the author wants becomes clear. Um, but I would suggest that quite often the author is kind of, half the time, kind of vamping till ready, you know. He's playing chords, you know, while the congregation comes into the church, you know, mm. waiting for something to happen. You know? um, 
writing something down in order to be keeping busy, establishing a presence. Mm. I remember many years ago talking to Andrew Motion and saying, how do you do it? He said, well, basically, I just go back and write the damn thing out again and see if something happens. <laughs> and I, well, I, know, I know what he means. I know what he meant. I mean, his methods may have altered, but you write it down and then you see if something else proposes itself. You know, can you reorganize the sentence structure? You know? You know, can you change the point of view slightly? Mm. That kind of thing. But I'm, no, I'm interested. I mean, uh, at Newcastle University, there's a big AHRC project going on. We recently bought the archive of Blood Axe Books, the poetry publishers, which is extremely interesting in itself. And there's been a big project going on where a mixture of poets, critics, and scholars have been invited in to look at the archive and you know, pursue their interests, see what happens. Um, and a couple of people, because Blood Axe are my first publisher, there's material mm. by me there, you know, so there are drafts, there are revised texts of one or two early poems, you know. And they kept saying, oh, sure, we found this really interesting poem. Oh, Christ, that's the worst poem I ever wrote in my life. You know, why is it in there? You know, it's <laughs> because I didn't put it in the collective plans. I, I remember laboring over it for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and eventually thinking, after it was in a book, I thought, this is a complete waste of time. It's just dead. You know, it doesn't, it just lies there looking vaguely like a poet. You know, nothing happens. You know. But these postgraduate students were interesting you know, because it's intriguing to see something happening 30, mm. 35 years ago. But it's not objection. No, I mean, the language of, of it's just how the language of sort of maybe mild embarrassment or shame or at least privacy comes up a lot in discussion about about manuscripts. And I suppose genetic critics often see themselves as being in some ways like shrinks, you know, it's like analysts who have some kind of privileged insight or you know, unconscious in, into an unconscious process that the writers themselves might not be entirely aware of. Um, and certainly some writers like Elliot, I think, with the Wayside manuscript, prove remarkably kind of cherry or resistant to, to people looking at it, you know, as if this document did have the potential to embarrass them. I don't wonder whether, I mean, you, what you've said doesn't, doesn't really suggest that, I suppose, but whether you think there is any possibility um, for the sort of therapeutic or the analytic in this kind of study, whether would we, could we learn interesting things not just about the poem, but about you in some ways. And your, I don't know, but I, I don't think I don't think that would be interesting. You know, I, mean, I don't think the the author of the poems is is the interesting element. You know, I think the poem itself is the interesting thing. I mean, I'm quite I'm kind of with Eliot. He said you know, the poem is an effort to render something impersonal, mm -hmm. which I take to mean to make something which can, has a, has its own life to lead, you know, which is not tied to a biography. You, you'll remember some years ago now the publication of Ted Hughes's posthumous collection of mm. birthday poems, birthday letters. You know. uh, and I have to say, and I was probably in the minority at the time, but I thought it was a very weak book. Yeah. And the, the reception of it was almost entirely biographical, which is, of course, what you'd expect in the newspapers, you know, because everything comes tied to personalities. You know. All depictions of writing turn out to be depictions of writers, which I think is unfortunate. But you know, it was a poor book, and, but it was talked about as being, you know, revealing of a relationship. I think, well, that may be so, but are the poems any good? You know? Yeah. yeah. You know, the bloke who looks like the door to me probably writes a diary, which is revealing of a relationship, but yeah. we're not going to be wanting to read it 200 years hence for that reason. The other poems that got. So I like the idea that the poem is relatively autonomous, as the Marxists would say. I think this is this is probably going to be my last question, and then I'm sure that we'd like to, to you know see if any of you have, have other questions that you want to pose to Sean. But um, yeah, I mean around this question of um, autonomy and, and I suppose the posthumous. Um, do you have any thoughts about the relationship between revision and editing? I mean, it seems to me that maybe as a poet goes on in their career and becomes more successful, that they might have less reason to revise, and that they might suddenly be provoked less by editors to revise. So that in a way, Ted Hughes, you know, at the end of his career, is probably famous, but could sort of get away with a lot more than maybe, you know, in the 20s or 30s. 
that uh, really came to the first book published, taking all creative writing courses and working with teachers, that people may really become worse at revision as they get on, or um, and what's the relationship? I'm sure, I'm sure it varies a great deal. I'm sure it varies a great deal. Um, I think it's a very good idea that, uh, to think in terms of revision. Uh, I think it's a good idea to think in terms of revision for as long as possible. And the fact that you develop facility and have a great deal of experience is no guarantee that what you're doing is, is working. Uh, I mean, I'm very lucky. My editor for the last 10 years has been Don Patterson, who's a very, very meticulous and acute editor you know, who questions absolutely everything, you know, and I find that very fruitful, you know, having an editor who's really attentive to the work is good, and one can think of some very distinguished poets who haven't really had that experience in their later careers, you know, Hughes would be one, it seems to me, you know, if somebody had stood up to him and said, look, Ted, you know, this is just, you know, this isn't working, why don't you look at it again? That might have been such a bad idea. Mm. It might have been fatal for the person who suggested it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it might not have been such a bad idea. But uh, um, So editing is one thing, but revision, yeah. Well, I suppose, because I teach writing, mainly to postgraduates, I suppose what I'm really talking about is trying to get them to read what they, what they themselves are writing in such a way as to be able to revise it. You know? of having a certain liberty in relation to their own work so that they're not prisoners of a sort of imaginative monolith mm -hmm. without finding some way of exerting an influence on it. Yeah, yeah but Valerie talks about me reading without the feeling of paternity. Um, so that seems like a useful idea to me. I mean, the, the yeah. reading of something is if you're reading it coldly, like it belongs to somebody else, and that that allows for the most extreme of creative kinds of... Mm. It's difficult, I mean, because you are the product of your own habits and obsessions, you know, but to be able to stand off from it is very useful. To have somebody to help you to do that is very useful as well. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. I mean, for me, this has just been a really fantastic chance to, to get to look into, you know, the kinds of documents that um, I'm always seeking out, but then we have to go to you know, distant libraries in the US or something to look at. And it's really cool to be able to see things from, from poems that haven't actually yet been published as well. I mean, you know, while in some ways the theatre of creation is still um, ongoing.